Chapter Eleven of the Law of the Honey Bee by Tickner Edwards. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Mystery of the Swarm. The old swarm in May, beloved of ancient bee men, is rapidly becoming a thing of the past. Modern hives and modern methods although they have not as yet achieved their main intent of abolishing natural swarming altogether yet tend to bring this extraordinary ebullition of hive life to its fulfilment later and later in each year far from being a virtue as of old an early swarm or indeed any swarm at all is now accounted a misfortune even a downright disgrace in scientific beemanship and yet the bees though easy to discourage are hard to teach in spite of roomy hives and a watchful bee master ready to give them an unbroken succession of young and fertile queens and a whole houseful of new furniture at a moment's notice still the bees go on playing this mad game of wholesale truantry and still the beekeeper must stand looking hopelessly on from the midst of his elaborate appliances while his property sings about his ears or wings away into the upper skies irrevocable as last year's mill water beemen call it the swarming fever and fever it is in very truth the reasons for it have long ago been crystallized into exact and accepted phrases an overcrowded condition of the hive the desire of the bees to get rid of a failing queen the excitement of the queen herself at the menace of coming rivals the natural instinct of colonies to increase and multiply anything but the one all-sufficient and obvious reason that bees swarm because they suddenly and intensely desire it the story of the sioux indian one for civilization from boyhood over-educated and over-refined decorated with a high college degree and adorning a great pulpit and then casting it all to the four winds stripping and painting himself and raging away with his kind on the war trail has a near parallel in the behaviour of bees at swarming time instinct could never be a party to such an inconsequent outrageous brilliantly reckless joyous proceeding but it is ever in the way of reason to be splendidly unreasonable at times and here the honey-bee shows herself the true child of her origins from a stern self-elected destiny-maker callously pressing to the forefront of life over all obstacles of heart and hearth she changes back for the nonce into the aboriginal bee-woman thoughtless pleasure-loving improvident spending the garnered treasure of laborious days in the one mad moment's frolic for it is impossible to regard the incident of the swarm as only one more link in the chain of sober calculating bee wisdom it is obviously a lapse a general falling away from the all-wise public polity for a single hour in her drudging joyless perfect life the worker bee battens down all the virtues and rages forth like the sioux indian to swill at the stream of forbidden love and laughter unmindful of the cost just when the common self-abnegation is yielding its rich first fruits of prosperity and the hive is overflowing with its wealth of citizens and possessions this fever comes among them and spreads like a prairie fire by all laws of prudence it is now 
of all times that every child of the mother state should stand by her mightily to uphold her in the high place won for her by unending toil and innumerable lives but old ancestral memory wakens calling irresistibly nature in the beginning of time made the honey-bee to inhabit a tropic land where there was no need for pent cold withstanding houses nor any use in laying up provender for days of dearth because the land flowed with perpetual honey bee life in those far-off ages was all dancing in the sunshine and the bee woman had little to do but to fly to the nearest brimming flower cup when her nurslings wanted food but a cooling world the ever northward trend of her race and then the folly of her own wisdom intellect turning upon itself all combined to lose for her the old slothful paradise of plenty the drone reasoning inversely by the wisdom of his folly made a better compromise with fate he held to his life of ease and his gratuitous pleasures at all cost and let his mate go her way undeterred blinding his eyes to the new necessities work and responsibility gradually soured and sharpened and hardened the one while dependence on his womankind as insidiously changed the other into a creature of idleness and the senses and when he came at last to realize the outcome of it all it was too late the matriarchal commonwealth was established hedged round securely with a myriad poison blades to live a drone had been his heart's desire and now dronehood mere seminality was allotted to him as a retribution the things for which man lifts his unregarded prayer all his life through might very well prove his fittest punishment granted to him in the hereafter so little can man or drone distinguish between the enduring things of life and death but of all intolerable fates that must be least bearable to have wisely willed and beautifully fashioned our own eternity and then being only human or at least reasonable to find its goodness really smooth going colour fast impregnable at all points with never a bright break or flaw to vary the monotony of well-doing no wonder the honey-bee swarms breaks helter-skelter out of her prison bounds of order commendable toil chill maidenly propriety and goes rioting away for one short hour of joyousness and madcap frolic such as her primeval sisters looked to as the common day's lot when there were no hives and motherhood was not the sole prerogative of one in thirty thousand and when the sun burned high and cheerily in heaven from end to end of the tropic year it is easy to be wise and temperately scientific in accounting for this feverish impulse of the worker bees allotting it a sound and circumspect part in the furtherance of the general polity but is it not in the main nature the atrophied sexual spirit awakening or at least stirring a little in her age-long sleep in the sultry august evenings the young queens of the ant hills pour out in unnumbered thousands to meet the males and people the ruddy sunshine with the glint of their wings this is swarming in its truest sense the wingless workful underground existence follows but the love flight of the ants while it lasts is none the less a real intensely joyous thing 
and surely the swarming fever that so strangely and inopportunely seizes upon hive life is at one with it in nature and spirit although its original purpose and value have been long ago lost in the ages the one in the whole multitude who alone has the full inheritance of her sex the queen bee seems often at the fountainhead of the revolution sometimes undoubtedly it is she who first develops this longing feverish unrest and by little and little communicates it to the whole colony here the variability of bee nature comes sharply into evidence some hives will show this restless spirit for many days before the swarm issues while with others the great upheaval seems as far as the mass of bees is concerned to be a sudden unpremeditated thing occurring in the midst of the universal content and industry the preparations for raising new queens are always taken in hand betimes but probably this is the work of the far-seeing sober old bees of the hive with whom communism has become a settled and accepted calamity the bees who will ultimately constitute the swarm may be supposed to nourish their secret desire from the first moment the queen shows signs of mutability to neglect all their old tasks first in heart and then in reality and finally when the queen's mood has reached its culminating point and her work in the hive is in virtual abeyance to throw down plummet and trowel and hod and rush forth in a wild hilarious company urged by a longing that they are as powerless to resist as to understand in the study of bee life one comes upon many questions but seldom answers to fit all if the queen's fecundation takes place only once in her life and nature intends this to suffice for her whole fruitful period it is not easy to see why she should go out with the swarm at all that she is not the inveterate recluse as generally believed and that she does occasionally make short flights in the open during her laying career is well proved the desire therefore to see the light again after a long incarceration cannot be urged as her reason for going off with the swarm a much more plausible notion is that the sexual spirit is again roused in the queen just as it seems to be roused for the first time in the worker bee and that withal the journey is undertaken as a mating flight a faint re-echo of a racial custom long extinct bearing the closest analogy to the marriage swarm from the ant hill it must be borne in mind that although the queen bee is undoubtedly rendered capable of producing her kind of both sexes during several years as the result of a single fertilization it cannot be incontestably held that she never again meets the drone under any circumstances there is nothing in her physical organism to prevent a second coition although with the drone this is impossible for more reasons than the all-sufficient one that he dies in his marriage hour in the old bee gardens where the swarm in may is still a living present thing it is pleasant to sit with the proprietor under the rosy shade of apple boughs waiting for the swarms to issue and talking bees which is the most nerve-soothing soul-refreshing occupation in the world there never was a bee-keeper new style or old style too busy to talk provided that you met him with understanding 
and were as impatient as he of digressions from the all-important theme one soon gets tired of imparting information as to the wonders of hive life to the ignorant and plainly apprehensive stranger and none sooner than he of the old school in the quietest apiary of pure-bred english bees there are always a few individuals of crotchety nature who will search you out in the shady orchard seat and as like as not knife you on the least provocation if you are a bee man you treat these vindictive approaches with unconcern you go on listening to the old man's talk while the bee shrills away at your eyelids or creeps into your ear and out again if you keep quiet she will soon relinquish the dull sport and wing harmlessly away and the thread of the master's discourse is not interrupted but the uninformed stranger is a nuisance at these solitudes for two he flinches and shudders makes little irritating retreats beats about wildly with his hands or if he is made of the sternest metal he sits rigidly upright when he should be reclining at his ease and turns such a painfully polite though distracted ear to his informant that the stream of talk is sure to dry up incontinently and he feels as little welcome as ghostly banquo at the feast when you have once lived among hives it is a sore thing to be without their music on warm days winter and summer alike there is always this drowsy dreamy song in the air and dancing without the fiddlers is no more depressing an occupation than to a bee-man is loitering in a garden of mere silent vegetables and flowers sitting now under the bower of apple blossoms and watching for the swarms the full sweet note from the hives comes over to you like the very voice of serene content it pervades the sunshine it gently qualifies the slow wind in the treetops it lifts and falls like the lilt of a far-off summer sea this is the labour song the song of the swarm is very different to the trained ear the caesura that presently comes in the midst of the music is as clear as a pistol shot though you may detect no change the old beekeeper stops short in his wandering tale about famous honey years of half a lifetime back seizes key and pan and hurries across the garden it is the old green hive again he tells you as you press hard upon his heels it is always the old green hive that has swarmed the earliest every may for years back and forthwith the key and pan begin their clattering ding-dong melody old-fashioned beekeeping is not always a matter of straw box hives without of course the modern inside furniture have been in use nearly as long as the straw skep and the hives in the garden are of this ancient pattern the old green hive is keeping well up to its reputation already it is the centre of a swirling crowd of bees and as you look a dense black stream of them is pouring out of the entrance so fast and furiously that it is almost impossible to distinguish what they are and the old wild trek song is growing louder and deeper with every moment a rich vibrant tenor note unlike any other sound in nature there is no doubt at all of its import as you stand in the wing darkened sunshine caught up in the excitement of it all and feeling much as if you were facing a tearing sou'west gale every bee of the twenty or thirty thousand 
volleying madly to and fro overhead is singing her bravest and loudest there is only one meaning to the whole gargantuan chorus it is sheer jubilation melodized a wild glad song of freedom as though not a bee amongst them had ever before set eyes on the sunshine and the wealth of an english may the great door key a ponderous antiquated piece of metal beats out its clanging note and the swarm lifts higher and higher into the blue gradually the sombre mist of bees draws closer together looking now like a little dark cloud strayed from a forgotten summer storm now it sails slowly northward and lightens as the sunlight is caught by the beating wings as in a net of silver and now it veers away into the very eye of the sun and changes into black revolving tracery again whirring wheels within wheels of insect life spinning wheels making thread to weave the garments of a whole nation and humming as never spinning wheels hummed before but the beginning of the end is nigh the time of singing is nearly over the old bee man stops his weird tom tomming throws down key and pan and points to the topmost branch of a young apple sapling you see a little black knot of bees clinging to it no larger than a pigeon's egg a moment later and it has grown to the size of a double fist and another moment sees it twice this size again as the flying bees stream towards it from all directions now it is as big as a quart measure and the branch is slowly bending down under its weight in an incredibly short space of time the whole swarm has joined the cluster they hang together in a long brown glistening cigar-shaped mass well-nigh touching the ground and the wild merry music is over for good gently swaying in the sunlight lifeless and inert but for a few restless bees that hum about it the sight of a settled swarm has an almost uncanny effect on most observers a little before the whole garden was filled with its deafening joyous hubbub now a strange silence has fallen and it is impossible to disassociate from its present state the idea of an abject depression and disillusionment as though the whole thing had been but a mad escapade of which the bees were now heartily ashamed if we may conceive the issue of a swarm to be a freak of ancestral memory the sudden irresistible impulse to follow an old racial habit long obsolete it is not difficult to account for the obvious change of mind that has now come over the absconding host packed within the hive in a feverish surging multitude disabilities were not self-evident as they are now tried in the light of day violent delights have violent ends and in their triumph die and now there is the morrow to be thought of life to be rendered possible in all odds of weather a home to be made the queen mother to be sheltered she the one remaining possession of the crowd beggared now but so rich a moment before there is hard work ahead enough to sober the giddiest among them the madness has gone as quickly as it came and now the honey-bee is to show herself a reasoning creature if never before it is believed by most bee-keepers that a swarm selects the site of its future dwelling some time before the expedition starts in many cases several days earlier 
an old trick among cottagers is to place out empty hives in their gardens and these not uncommonly attract errant swarms a few bees are seen cruising about and subjecting the hives to a close scrutiny these pioneer bees disappear and after a variable time from a few minutes to a few hours or even days a whole army of bees suddenly descends from the sky and takes possession of the new home when the interval between the appearance of the scouts and the arrival of the main body is only a short one the reconnoitring bees have been manifestly sent out by the clustered swarm but in the case of long periods elapsing the scouts must have been sent in search of the new location before the swarm issued probably although the bulk of the party is imbued with this reckless spirit alone thinking and caring for nothing else but the escape and the frolic many of the older and wiser bees undertake the matter in a temperate business-like way as they would go about any other important hive operation in one sense therefore the old notion of there being subordinate lieutenants captains and governors in a hive may not be so very far from the truth that these scouts are actually sent out to find a suitable site for the new colony either before the swarm leaves or while it is clustered in the open is a well-established fact so that some of the bees at least must keep their wits about them throughout the general chaos and with these wiser virgins must be reckoned the queen in spite of the fact that she joins in the public excitement and restlessness for some days before the great emigration her work of egg-laying is largely arrested and this retentive action renders her so heavy and bulky that often she can scarcely get on the wing the object of this is that she may be all the more ready for laying when the new home is established it is also well ascertained that all swarming bees have their honey sacks well filled and this loading up for the journey takes place just before the signal for departure is given there is great variation in the behaviour of the different stocks in a bee garden during the swarming season and many close observers are unable to detect any sure signs that a particular hive is going to swarm but it appears fairly well established that when a swarm is imminent nearly all the bees of that stock remain at home even when all other hives in the garden are in full foraging activity such a hive gives out a peculiar throbbing note which suggests the noise made by a powerful locomotive brought to a standstill but with full steam up and impatient to be gone just before the issue of the swarm there is often a curious lull in this pent-up forceful sound and probably this is the moment when the travellers are lading themselves up for the march immediately after and here it is difficult not to believe that a definite authoritative signal for the movement is given a sudden stir and tumult begins in the centre of the crowded hive much like that caused by a heavy stone cast into water this radiates swiftly in all directions until it reaches the bees near the entrance and then the general rush for the daylight starts where a hive is much overcrowded there will already be a cluster of bees numbering many thousands packed tightly together on the alighting board and sometimes covering the whole face of the hive but this mass melts away directly the swarming begins the waiting bees taking wing 
all but simultaneously with the others it was anciently believed that the queen led the swarm but this view is not borne out by modern observation as often as not half the bees are on the wing before she makes her appearance and sometimes she is among the very latest to leave or she may decide at the last moment not to go at all in this case the bees do not cluster but after a few minutes wild tarantelli in the sunshine they all troop back to the hive when once the swarming party has gone off the old hive seems to settle down to its ordinary occupations as though nothing out of the way had happened the congested state of affairs no longer exists but otherwise the work of the hive is proceeding in the usual way the bees left behind are mainly young workers who have not yet commenced foraging but there is always a fair sprinkling of old workers and drones generally the hive is queenless for the time being the new queen not having yet broken from her cell there may be four or five queen cells in various stages of development or rarely as many as a dozen sometimes however the first of the queens will be already hatched and wandering over the combs meeting as usual at this stage of her career perfect indifference from all she encounters but hives have been known to send off a swarm when the preparations for raising a new queen have been scarcely begun so variable is the honey-bee in all her ways if the objects of swarming were merely to relieve the congestion in the hive and to change the mother bee the whole thing should now be at an end but the swarming impulse is rooted in far deeper soil than mere expediency with some strains of bees the fever seems to die out after the one attack and the stock settles down quietly to work for the rest of the season but more often than not this first taste of adventure serves only to whet the national appetite for more about nine days after the first swarm leaves another swarm often follows and this may be succeeded by a third or even a fourth at a few days interval resulting in some cases in the almost complete extinction of the stock the old skepis called the second swarm a cast the third was a cult and the fourth a filly it is difficult to understand how in a community where individual interest is so ruthlessly sacrificed to the general good this self-destructive policy should be permitted but taking the view that swarming is in the main a vague and incomplete resurrection of a long obsolete habit in bee life a workable theory at once suggests itself under primeval conditions the continued life of the mother colony may have been unnecessary its purpose may have been fully served when a number of young queens and drones had been raised and the whole had swarmed out together each to form a new settlement it must be remembered that the beehive persisting indefinitely from year to year is really quite a modern creation and became practicable only with the invention of the movable comb frame which allowed the bee master to effect the renewal of combs it has been seen that the brood combs get gradually choked up with the pupa cocoons which each bee leaves behind it these webs are so incredibly thin that a dozen of them make little appreciable difference to the capacity of the cell and combs have been known to remain in use for brood raising as long as twenty years 
but eventually they must become useless and then as bees do not or cannot remove old combs to make way for new the community must leave for a new home or gradually die out thus the age of the old hives was definitely limited modern beemanship has wrought many other changes in the life of the honey-bee in addition to creating the permanent hive city the number of bees in a single strong stock housed in a modern frame hive is probably three times as great as that of a wild colony the work of the bee master affects almost every aspect of bee life enlarging the scale and the scope of all that the bees attempt the result of this is seen not only in an increased population and more extensive works but in a change in the very systems of life plans that work very well on a small scale do not always succeed on a large the sanitary problems of a city are necessarily very different from those of a village in principle as well as in degree and probably much of the ingenuity of system and device observable in modern hive life is directly due to human agency the new conditions introduced by the bee master serving to educate the bees to greater effort and resource the behaviour of these after swarms offers a curious contrast to that of the first one if it were possible to point to one fixed and invariable law in bee life it would be to the fact that a prime swarm will leave the hive only on a fine warm day and generally about noon but casts and colts and fillies seem to take no count of time or weather issuing just as the mood besets them early or late and caring nothing apparently for the conditions abroad it is even on record that once a second swarm came off at midnight when the moon was at the full and the weather very clear and warm there seems altogether much more method in the madness that seizes on a colony swarming for the first time and if thereafter the hive settles down to its old courses the national character for sobriety and industry soon rehabilitates itself but it is just the strength of this public inclination towards order and labour which vary so greatly in different hives how matters are likely to go can be readily ascertained by setting careful watch on the hive from the day the first swarm leaves there are sure to be several queen cells some capped over and almost ready to hatch out and others in various stages of development all these cells are constantly and assiduously guarded by the worker bees because directly one of the queens is hatched her first thought is to make a speedy end to all future rivalry by murdering her sisters she comes from her cell evidently spoiling for a fight and imbued to the core with that inveterate hatred of her kind which is the ruling passion of her existence that worker bees and queen bees should have an identical origin and yet that the nature of the one is to live in perfect harmony while the nature of the other is to be at perpetual war is one of those mysterious things in bee life which probably will never be explained if the queen bee of today can be really taken as an approximate type of the aboriginal female of her race it is not difficult to understand that after her generation in force the communal life of the mother stock would become an impossibility and that with the mating swarm 
its natural existence was brought to a close much as we see it happen in wasp life it is during the quiet nights after the issue of a swarm that the peculiar shrill voice of the queen is most frequently heard as she strives with the guards that surround the cells of the other young queens as yet unliberated she continually utters this quick piping cry and is immediately answered by the smothered cries of the imprisoned ones who are just as anxious as she for the fray if the swarming fever is not yet allayed in the hive this war cry is bandied to and fro unceasingly and the general ferment deepens until the condition of things having seemingly grown intolerable the young queen rushes out followed by the greater number of the bees in the case of after swarms the consensus of evidence is in favour of the belief that the queen is really the leader of the party although here again no positive rule is observed it may happen however that the stock is sick of all the turbulence and unrest that have so long beset it and that the general desire is to restore the status quo under these conditions the sounds from the hive may have a very different quality and meaning the queen still sends forth her shrill challenge but now her cry is immediately followed by a curious hissing sound from the bees it is exactly as if they were shouting her down compelling her to silence by their own uproar and when the war cry of the first liberated queen is thus met by a chorus of disapprobation it seldom happens that the stock swarms again in a few days the queen goes forth alone on her honeymooning adventures and on her return she is allowed to indulge her penchant for sororicide to her heart's content End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of the law of the honey bee by tickner edwards this librivox recording is in the public domain the comb builders in the foregoing chapters an attempt has been made to show that the honey bee lives and moves and has her being in a world which must be actuated by something better than mere instinct in the common usage of the term to the modern biologist the earnest out-of-door student of life under all its manifestations this may appear as a rather obvious and unnecessary gilding of gold and the only question yet undecided may seem to be where in the scale of reason the honey-bee is to find her equitable place all bee-lovers must plead guilty to an inveterate partisanship the writer frankly among their number there is no laodiceanism in bee-craft and all the world over it may be said that where a few beehives have been got together there is always to be found a red-hot enthusiast not far off the word freemasonry in the english tongue has grown to be a synonym for the truest fraternity but just as real and almost as far-reaching is the brotherhood among keepers of bees no doubt among themselves the tendency is rather to magnify the virtues and achievements of their charges to be over lavish of inference from too scanty or too isolated facts and the proved impossibility of having anything to do with the honey-bee without being carried away sooner or later on a high crest of enthusiasm 
makes any attempt at holding the balances truly between the zealous bee-lover and the interested but temperate-minded reader a difficult and delicate task any writer on the honey-bee nowadays must be reckoned an ultra-specialist in an age of specialism and here it is not easy to preserve the sense of proportion undimmed especially for one admittedly speaking out of the ranks of beemanship where all are aiders and abettors in ardour impatient of any estimation falling short of high water mark the story of the comb builders however sets none of the usual pitfalls in the way of the over enthusiastic penman in its soberest incident and least important detail it is so wonderful that exuberance of language is as powerless to exaggerate as a niggardly tongue to minimise its true and due effect if the ordering of the bee commonwealth the intricate systems of sanitation division of labour treatment of the queen and worker larvae and the like is subject for marvel and seems infallibly to denote the possession of high faculties a much greater degree of acumen must be conceded to the worker bee when we come to consider her as the designer and builder of honeycomb it is here that she shines in her most significant light the complicated structures with which she fills the bee city do not call for unwearying toil alone they could never have been fashioned unless the combined arts of engineer architect and mathematician had been brought to bear on them nor are they merely simple constructive and mathematical problems which the honey-bee is called upon to face nor though difficult unvarying and so amenable to instinctive solution in almost every comb built we see special and necessarily unforeseen difficulties met and triumphantly overcome in the construction of the six-sided cell with its base composed of three roms or diamonds the bee has adopted a form which our greatest arithmeticians admit to be the best possible for her requirements and she endeavours to keep to this form wherever practicable but it constantly happens in her work of comb building that local conditions interfere with her plans and then she will make five-sided cells or square cells or triangular or any other form just as the need impels her it is a facile comfortably finite thing to put all this down to a mysterious essence called instinct with which the organism of the bee has been divinely dosed as men serve electricity to a laden jar but it was not instinct that made wren put the steel cable round the dome of st paul's nor instinct that lifted the crown stones to the top of the great pyramids these are works of a creature more highly equipped and instigated yet their supremacy is all of a piece with the honeycomb which is made of a material fragile light as air but which by the art of the bee becomes capable not only of supporting but of suspending a weight thirty times as great as its own that the bee does not collect her building materials but derives them from her own body is a fact that has come to light only within the last hundred and fifty years or so although several shrewd guesses at the truth are to be found in the works of the medieval bee masters the wasp who has much of the ingenuity of the honey-bee but is doomed to exercise it in a far more humble direction makes a six-sided cell 
but her matter is collected from outside and can only be put to comparatively simple uses as it is incapable of bearing tensile strain beeswax alone of all constructive materials in the world seems to meet every requirement it can be worked into plates as thin as the one hundred and eightieth part of an inch which is the normal thickness of the cell wall it is indestructible to all the elements save heat it can be rendered soft and easily workable or allowed to harden while still retaining its suppleness and life it is a bad conductor of heat and therefore conserves the heat of the hive vermin do not prey upon it so far as is known there is only one creature that will eat it a peculiar kind of moth larva against which however a strong stock can always hold its own and then as the raw materials for its production are secretions of the bee's own body the work of preparing it can be carried on when darkness or stress of weather have put an end for the time being to work out of doors the first labour undertaken by a swarm directly it has gained possession of its new quarters is the building of combs the apparent revulsion of feeling which succeeds the excitement of swarming soon passes off and the energies of the whole party are at once concentrated on furnishing and victualling the new hive the older bees commence foraging each bee as she goes forth hovering a moment with her head towards the hive to fix its location and appearance in her memory by far the greater portion however remain at home and unite in a dense cluster for wax making time is everything in these first operations of the new colony the queen with whom egg-laying has probably been suspended for a day past or even longer is overburdened with fecundity and must be supplied with thousands of brood cells without delay the foragers will be coming home laden with nectar and pollen and will need instant storage room wax must be made with all possible expedition and the young bees crowd together in the roof of the hive with their queen snug and warm in their midst no doubt one of the chief reasons why swarming bees unite themselves in the solid pendant mass of the cluster so soon after leaving the parent hive is to hasten this process of wax formation it has been proved that wax is most easily generated under the influence of great heat and this is well secured in the heart of the cluster by the time the scouts have decided on the new home and the swarm must rise again on the wing a great number of the bees will have their wax pockets filled and will be ready for the work of comb making when a swarm is hived even if it be only a short time after its issue the little white wax scales can be seen protruding from the armour joints of many of the bees and these are often dropped and lost in the general confusion one of the most difficult things to observe in bee life is the actual process of comb building the crush is so great and the movement of the bees so incessant that at first the comb seems to grow of itself rather than be made by the busy multitude for ever obscuring it from the watcher's eyes or giving him but the rarest glimpse now and then of its white delicate frailty of pattern these early efforts of the comb builders produced as they are under forced circumstances 
are occasionally faulty of design as though hastily knocked together sometimes the first groups of cells made by a swarm will have a yellow moist spongy appearance with thick irregular walls and are obviously little more than temporary vats to hold the incoming nectar until the proper honey cells can be constructed this emergency comb is specially interesting as affording one more instance of the worker bee's ever ready resource in the presence of difficulties in the ordinary way the mason bee hangs quietly in the cluster until her wax secreting organs have done their work and the six little oblong scales of brittle material are ready for manipulation these protrude from under the hard plates of her abdomen three on each side looking much like half-posted letters at one of the knee joints of her hind leg she has a peculiar implement of which there is not the slightest trace in the queen bee this is like a pair of nippers but instead of two converging points it is furnished on one side with a row of sharp stiff bristles and on the other with a shallow spoon with this special tool the worker bee grips the wax scale and draws it out of its pocket it is then transferred to her jaws and she hurries off with it to the comb building arrived at an unfinished cell she sets to work to chew up the raw wax into a paste incorporating it with her saliva and materially increasing its bulk the resulting soft ductile matter is then applied to the work and moulded into its needed shape in this way with hundreds of workers going and coming the delicate white fabric of brood and honeycomb is built up with extraordinary rapidity how the coarse spongy comb which swarms will sometimes manufacture is produced cannot be definitely stated it has all the appearance of having been made from raw wax hurriedly masticated and kneaded up with honey and probably this is its actual composition the secretion from the salivary gland is necessarily slow and with time pressing and a horde of impatient foragers dinning about her ears eager to unload and be off again to the clover the ingenious mason bee appears to have hit on the idea of using the contents of her honey sack as a substitute nothing however but a mechanical admixture can take place between honey and the raw wax this dissolves only under the influence of the bee's saliva which has intensely acid properties to understand all that the bees have accomplished when a new empty hive has been filled throughout with waxen comb it is necessary to follow the operations of the swarm pretty closely during the first few weeks of its separate life it is a big undertaking the building of an entire new bee city and the problems that confront the builders are many and complicated in the first place whether she ever attains it or not the worker bee will aim at nothing short of perfection hereditary experience tells her exactly what are the home requirements of the colony and she now sets to work to fulfil them in the best imaginable way a city is to be built which is to accommodate twenty or thirty thousand individuals vast nursery quarters must be constructed as there may be as many as ten or twelve thousand youngsters to cradle at one and the same time for at least six months of the year no food will be obtainable from outside 
so that the city must contain large storehouses capable of holding more than a six month supply as the temperature in winter can be kept up only by the bodily warmth of the inhabitants life in the city must be concentrated into the smallest possible space and the materials of which the city is built must be heat conserving while its construction must allow of perfect ventilation at all times and in summer it must permit a free circulation of air that the surplus heat can be readily carried off the city must be a fortress as well as a home and be closed in on every side as a protection against its many enemies as well as the weather there is another and just as vital a condition governing its construction the necessity for strict economy in material if there were any natural substance having the qualities of tenacity lightness ductility and strength which the bees could obtain out of doors instead of wax no doubt they would use it for comb building and they would not spend hours of precious time and consume large quantities of hard-won stores in the manufacture of their own material but it seems there is nothing in nature possessing the needful properties bees collect a resinous substance notably from the buds of the poplar which they use for stopping up crevices they dilute this also into a varnish with which they paint the finished combs and sometimes even combine it with wax to form a rough filling but it appears to be useless in cell construction the whole city must needs be made of wax and wax alone and the bees are as careful of this precious substance as a miser of his gold starting with these conditions efficient house accommodation for the colony secured at the least cost in time labour and material the bee tackles the problem before her with an ingenuity that is little short of astounding she appears to begin with the central dominant unit of the difficulty and to work outward vanquishing subsidiary problems as she goes her line of reasoning seems to run somewhat in this way to raise the young and store the honey there is needed some kind of cell or receptacle the young larvae being cylindrical in form a cylindrical cell is indicated and this shape will serve also for the honey barrels not a few however but many thousands of these vessels will be required they must therefore be placed close together as well for economy of space as for natural warmth the cells could be grouped together mouth upwards in horizontal planes story above story but such a method of construction would be economically unsound to prevent sagging in the heat of the hive and under the weight they will be called to bear the cell bases would have to be thickened collectively into a substantial floor which would need shoring up at intervals after the manner of the wasps but in this much valuable material would be diverted from its proper use obviously a better plan would be to lay all the cells on their sides and pile them up into a vertical wall and just as obviously is two walls of these superimposed cells were placed back to back so that one central vertical sheet of wax would serve to stop the ends of all the cells right and left a saving of half the material used for the cell bottoms would at once be effected but so far the design is still only in its crude initial stage the upright comb 
consisting of a double pile of round cells back to back with one flat base between although a great advance on the single sheet of horizontal cells is yet mechanically and economically deficient the round cells leave useless interstices which take much wax in the filling while the flat bottoms do not coincide with the form of the larvae and thus still more space is wasted clearly improvement can only come by altering the shape of the cell and now the bee seems to have asked itself and triumphantly answered an extremely complex question she knew how much internal cell space each larva required for growth the problem therefore was this of what shape nearly approaching the cylindrical ought such a cell to be made which would ensure the right dimensions but which would occupy the least possible room have the greatest possible strength consume the least possible material in its manufacture and possess the property that a number of similar cells could be built up in a double vertical plane leaving no interstices either between the cells or between the planes there is only one solution to this problem and the honey-bee found it who shall say how many ages ago in the hexagon cell with its base composed of three roms the whole astounding ingenuity of the thing can only be realized when a piece of nearly perfect new-made virgin comb has been closely examined it will be at once seen that the hexagon cells combine together over the surface of the comb in absolute geometrical union and that the six-sided form is round enough for all practical purposes looking into the cells on one side of the comb it will be noted that their bases take the form of depressed pyramids each made up of three diamond-shaped planes turning the comb over we see that the cells on this side also have pyramidal bottoms if the depth of a cell on one side of the comb be taken and added to the depth of a cell on the other side and then the width of the whole comb be measured it will be found that the combined depth of the two cells perceptibly exceeds the width of the whole comb at first glance this seems like a case of the less including the greater which is a manifest impossibility but holding the comb up to the light a further discovery is made and the seeming paradox is eliminated the bottoms of the cells are so thin as to be almost transparent and it is at once seen that the cells are not built end to end in line but that each cell base on one side of the comb covers part of three cell bases on the other if the three diamonds composing between them the triangular base of a single cell be perforated with a needle and the comb turned over it will be found that the three perforations come each in a separate cell thus the saving in the total width of the comb is effected by allowing the pyramidal bases on each side to engage alternately like the teeth of a trap instead of meeting point blank they overlap each other and the faces of the pyramids are so contrived that each of them helps to close two cells there is another advantage in this arrangement which will be immediately obvious the apex and three ribs of each pyramidal cell base form foundation lines for the cell walls on the other side of the comb this means that not only do all cell walls abut on an arch 
but that every cell base is strengthened throughout by a triple girdering the result is that the amount of wax required in the construction of the comb can be everywhere reduced to an absolute minimum it becomes merely a question of what thickness of wax will retain the honey and this experience proves to be no more than one hundred and eightieth part of an inch the whole thing indeed might very well be taken as an ideal exemplar of the triumph of mind over matter the geometric principles brought into play in the construction of honeycomb have been a favourite study with mathematicians of all ages and especially this rhombiform method adopted by the bee in flooring her cells the rhomb is best described as a plain figure whose four sides are equal like those of a square but whose angles are not right angles in such a figure there are necessarily two greater angles and two smaller facing each other in pairs the three rhombs composing the base of the honey cell lean together as has been seen in the form of a blunt pyramid and treating all angles as negligible factors the bluntness of this pyramid is found to coincide very aptly with the shape of the full-grown larvae but this is not the only reason for the particular inclination given by the bee to the rhombs forming the base of each cell economy rules here as in everything else she undertakes and the truth that she has chosen the one and only form of cell base which takes the least possible material to construct has received very striking confirmation the story is an old and famous one but it will bear repeating a great naturalist once put himself to an infinity of trouble in measuring the angles formed by the rhombs in a vast number of comb cell bases and he found that these showed remarkable uniformity it will be clear that the hollow pyramid of the cell bottom will be either deep or shallow according to the shape of the three rhombs composing it the apex of the pyramid is formed by the meeting of three equal angles one from each rhomb and it is plain that this apex will be sharp or blunt according to whether the meeting angles are wide or narrow it was of course impossible to ascertain the dimensions of these angles with absolutely microscopical nicety but dealing only with the most perfect comb the naturalist found that the two greater angles in the rhombs measured very nearly one hundred and ten degrees and the two lesser angles seventy degrees he also found that the angles formed by the conjunction of the cell sides with the bases had the same dimensions as those of the rhombs assuming therefore that mathematically the angles of the rhombs and the cell sides should be equal he was able to calculate exactly the angles for which the bees were evidently striving in the construction of the rhombs one hundred and nine degrees twenty eight minutes and seventy degrees thirty two minutes another bee lover scientist ruminating over these figures was much impressed by them and determined to find out the reason why the bee made such constant choice of this particular shape of rhomb he therefore conceived the idea of submitting the bee's judgment on this cell base question to an independent authority without disclosing his object he propounded the following problem to one of the greatest mathematicians of the day supposing said he in effect 
you were required to close the end of an hexagonal vessel by three rhombs or diamond-shaped plates what angles must be given to these rhombs so that the greatest amount of space would be enclosed by the least amount of material it was a difficult problem but the mathematician worked it out at last and his answer was one hundred and nine degrees twenty six minutes and seventy degrees thirty four minutes now the difference between the calculation of the man and the calculation of the bee was an exceedingly small one no one thought of calling into question the work of the man who was pre-eminent in his world of figures it was therefore accepted as a fact that the bee had made a trifling mistake so trifling however that in the matter of comb building it was of no importance her reputation was unimpaired to all intents and purposes the honey cell was still a perfect example of utmost capacity secured by least material but another mathematician a scotsman this time went over the whole business again and he proved conclusively that the bee was right while the first mathematician was wrong he showed that the true answer to the problem of the angles was one hundred and nine degrees twenty eight minutes and seventy degrees thirty two minutes identically the figures obtained by estimation of the honeycomb in the foregoing pages the principles involved in the construction of honeycomb have been gone into rather minutely because it is here that the lines of thought between the old and the new naturalists seem to make a typical divergence both schools are in the main agreed on the point that all forms of life emanate from the one omnipotent source and it matters little whether we speak of the vast periods of time during which the creation of all things was effected as ages or under the old biblical metaphor of days but whereas the old school appears to insist on different qualities of life immortal soul in man and a mystic subconscious perishable thing called instinct in the brute creation the new school is unable to see any distinction between the intellectual equipment of man and brute but that of degree between the honey-bee and her masters there is indeed a great gulf fixed but it is conceivably not unbridgeable and unless we are determined at all cost of logical violence to force a favourite set of square opinions into the round holes of observed fact it is difficult to see how the old position is long to remain tenable with regard to this particular question of comb building an attempt is still being made to show that it is entirely due to the working of certain natural laws and is independent of any intelligence or volition which the bees are supposed to exercise we are told that the cells are always begun in a circular form but that they afterwards assume the hexagon shape quite automatically in obedience to the laws of mutual interference and pressure as a proof of this it is pointed out that the outside cells of the comb not being subject to these laws are usually more or less rounded the pressure theory is hardly worth serious consideration as it is obvious that the growth of a honeycomb is perfectly free and untrammelled in every way if the bee makes her comb cells with six sides and a pyramidal base unthinkingly and under the yoke of imperious obligation it is certainly not because 
the cells force this shape upon one another like buffon's peas in a bottle and if we believe that the bee works blindly under the law of mutual interference any close examination of the results of her work must bring us to the conviction that we are only putting aside one marvel for something more wonderful still for then we see a natural law taking on a very unnatural quality that of intelligent adaptation to circumstances the comb intended for use in the hive nursery is made in two sizes that used for cradling the worker brood has cells measuring one-fifth of an inch across and a fraction less than half an inch deep while that designed for raising the drone larvae is built up of cells having a diameter of one quarter of an inch and a depth of about five eighths of an inch these different sized cells are not mingled indiscriminately over the comb but are grouped together in large blocks some of the combs will be entirely composed of worker cells which are always in the vast majority other combs will be made up of both kinds the bees begin a comb by attaching a small block of wax to the roof of the hive on either side of this they hollow out depressions which become the bases of the first cells the work is then extended downwards and sideways the cell bases being multiplied in all directions as fast as possible so that there are a great number of unfinished cells in progress long before the walls of the first cells have been completed there is a very reasonable motive for this procedure when a house is being built as much of the foundations as possible are laid in at the commencement to allow a large body of bricklayers to get to work on the walls at the same time and the bee extends her comb foundations on the same principle when about half the comb has been finished for worker brood it may be decided to commence building drone cells as the bases of the drone cells are larger than those of the worker cells it follows that a change must be effected in the ground plan of the comb the bees prepare for this transition very cleverly evidently studying how the regularity of the comb may be least interrupted sometimes the change is contrived without any appreciable loss of space but more often several misshapen cells have to be made before the symmetrical progress of the comb is resumed this depends largely on the inherited skill of the bees which varies according to their strain as all experienced beekeepers know now if the work of comb building is carried through by the bees under blind compulsion of the natural laws of mutual interference and pressure what other law it may be asked interferes with these in turn when the transition from one size of cell to another must be made if it is all a sort of crystallization going on independently of the bee's will or wish it appears more than curious that the mill should grind large or small just as the needs of the hive demand it but the whole position is really little else than a flagrant example of the evils of argument from a simile soaked peas in a bottle will swell to hexagons or rather dodecahedrons by the law of mutual interference soap bubbles will do the same with no more constriction than their own weight but peas and bubbles are things self-contained and separately existing 
before being brought together if the bees made a vast number of separate round cells and then combined them simultaneously no doubt all but the outside cells would assume the hexagon form but the essence of the whole art and ingenuity of comb building lies in the fact that there is no such thing as a separate cell each single compartment in the comb shares its parts with no less than nine other compartments and to talk of mutual interference when there is no separate existence is ploughing the sands indeed there are other circumstances connected with the work of the comb builders which go far to confirm the position that bees do exercise reason and that of a high order it has been said that the interior of a hive in daytime is not altogether deprived of light probably during the hours of greatest activity the bees have always enough light to see their way about by means of their wonderful indoor eyes which under the microscope have all the solemn wisdom of an owl's it is a fact however that comb building is usually carried on at night time when other employments are in temporary abeyance possibly the to our eyes profoundest darkness may be no darkness at all to the bees but to all appearances as we can judge of them honeycomb is virtually made in the dark but combs are built side by side often simultaneously they grow downwards together yet always preserve their right distance apart so that when finished there will be an intervening gangway between the sealed surfaces of about a quarter of an inch which is just enough to allow the two streams of bees to pass each other back to back how are these distances preserved seeing that the bees at work on the bottom edge of each comb are separated by a space of perhaps an inch and a half of empty darkness a simple experiment will at once give a clue to this if a hive in which a swarm has constructed about half its depth of comb be cantered a little sideways so as to throw the combs out of the perpendicular and the hive be then left for several days it will be found on examination that all building from the moment of disturbance has followed on the new line of verticality the combs will all be slightly bent to one side this means either that the bees have a natural sense of the perpendicular or that they work by the plumb line as humanity is constrained to do the fact seems to be that the hanging cluster of wax-making bees performs the office of a living plummet and really guides the comb in its downward progress yet do bees always suspend their combs do they never construct a waxen storehouse raising it tier above tier from the floor of the hive after the system of the more intelligent creature man the first commentary on this is that such a departure from their common methods would be no improvement but a retrograde step these long comb walls of the bees have a close analogy to the modern transatlantic skyscraper building the trouble with all such buildings is to provide them with sufficient base for their height if american engineers had at their disposal a material of adequate tensile strength and there were anything in nature to hang them from it would be scientifically a better plan to suspend these buildings than to erect them because the house would then naturally tend to keep its verticality and the base problem would cease to exist 
on the same principle the bees having at hand a material of almost ideal tensility and a suitable hanging beam wisely suspend their heavily weighted combs from the roof instead of erecting them like certain kinds of ant structures but it is undoubtedly long racial experience and not inability to follow the humanly approved method that guides them here rarely so rarely that the writer in the course of many years spent among bees has seen only three examples of it bees will build comb upwards if circumstances will allow no other way and this would seem not only to drive the last coffin nail for the poor instinct theory but to carve its epitaph as well in one of the instances referred to a glass bottom box had been inverted over the feed hole of a common hive and had there remained forgotten as the season progressed the hive grew great with bees and honey and it became imperative to build additional store comb in the box overhead but its slippery glass roof would give no foothold to the builders time and again they must have tried to get upon it with their wax hods filled and ready and each time failed the ordinary way of comb building was clearly impossible then the engineers of the hive inspired by the difficulty got to work in another way on the wooden surface below they laid out the plan of a garner house not after their usual method of parallel combs but a regular oblong house with cellular storerooms and communicating passages in between upon this they raised story above story of horizontal cells until the glass roof was nearly reached at this stage apparently the honey flow came to an end in the fields for the cells in the storehouse were never sealed though all were nearly full of honey and later in the season it was found and carried away by the bee master who still preserves it as a curiosity he bears a well-known name that of dr herbert macdonald philpotts of kingswear devon and his testimony as to the making of this unique little honey house is beyond question but indeed it carries in itself infallible evidence of its authenticity all honey cells made by bees have a slight upward inclination which helps as has already been explained to retain their contents until they can be capped over and every cell in the storehouse clearly showed this upward slant End of chapter twelve